There are plenty of predictions of when we will have computers which surpass the human brain in functionality. In this face-off, I'll show why most of these estimates are totally off base because they overlook important facts about how biological neurons and computers actually work. That means that artificial general intelligence is not some far off future that we can ignore, but could emerge at any time. We need to plan seriously now for AGI with all its potential benefits and risks. So what's the face-off? We'll go six rounds of progressively better estimates. In the first corner, we have a typical human brain. It's got 84 billion neurons and perhaps a quadrillion synapses. But these are really slow, switching in about a millisecond. But the brain is really efficient with energy and packs a serious punch on only 20 watts. In the other corner, we have a stack of CPUs. We'll be asking how many of today's CPUs would it take to equal the punch of the human brain? For comparison, we'll use an AMD Threadripper 32 core CPU. It contains about 20 billion transistors, each of which can switch in a few picoseconds about a billion times faster than the neuron or synapse counterparts. Configured as a server, the CPU is an energy hog drawing over 100 watts, but it delivers 1.3 teraflops, a bit over a trillion floating point operations per second. How many of these CPUs would we need to offer even odds on this matchup? Let's start with round one, the classic. You've seen this one before, so I'll be really quick. At 84 billion neurons in the human brain, each with 10,000 synapses, each synapse could deliver the equivalent of 1,000 floating point operations per second. Multiply that all together, and you get 840,000 teraflops. To win this round, we'd need a stack of over half a million servers, a tower over 30 miles tall. So let's move on to round two, which I call the classic two, which is slightly less wrong. When the neuroscientists look inside the brain, they observe three distinct brain areas, and the area responsible for thinking, the neocortex, is only about 16 billion neurons. Neuroscientists also observe that neurons don't actually fire a thousand times per second, but that 200 would be closer to the mark. Repeating the calculation from round one, to win this round, now we need only 24,000 servers. Many, many people rely on these first two estimates to erroneously conclude that AGI is a problem of some far-off future that we don't need to think about today. An important observation from the first two rounds is that the brain's computation requirement is independent of the synapse count because adding a synapse adds the corresponding tiny computational component. This is in contrast with a computer where the computational requirement goes up linearly with the number of synapses. For round three, the neuroscientists also tell us the 16 billion neurons of the neocortex don't fire very often. Theoretically, they could, but if they did, our brains would overheat and our heads would explode. To stay within the observed energy consumption, neurons can spike at a maximum rate of only once every six seconds or so for a maximum of a total of 2.5 billion firings per second. 
By an interesting coincidence, I have benchmarked my Neuron engine on our Contender CPU as processing 2.5 billion synapses per second with 32 cores. I got this number by creating a network of 5 billion synapses which could run complete cycles in less than 2 seconds. It took 30 seconds to allocate those 5 billion synapses, which is not relevant to this calculation, but will be important in the next. The coincidence of the 2.5 billion spikes and the 2.5 billion synapses per second makes the calculation easier. Now the number of CPUs needed to win this round is equal to the average number of synapses per neuron. Still assuming 10,000 synapses per neuron, we could win this round with 10,000 CPUs, which is within the realm of a project we could start today. For example, the Microsoft Azure website says that I can buy a subscription today for up to 100 clusters, each with up to 1,000 nodes. Whether this is realistic is a question superseded by the remaining rounds. For round four and for the remaining rounds, we need to understand just a bit more about synapses in the brain and how for some problems, computers can be radically more efficient. First, the similarities are that your brain and the neuron engine both have synapses defined as connecting two neurons with a weight. Also, both your brain and a computer can modify synapse weights fairly easily, although the computer is much faster. As mentioned before, in your brain, additional synapses have no computing cost, while in the computer, as we've seen, the number of synapses is the primary computing cost. And what do we know about resources which are free? You use a lot of them. In this round, I'll show how most of the synapses in your brain are unnecessary to a computer emulation. While it's easy to modify a synapse weight, in your brain, new synapses cannot be created at anywhere near this speed. Your brain, with all its neurons and synapses, develops from birth and within the first few years of life. After that, neurons and synapses don't grow or move around much, and to the extent they do, it's a slow process. This means that if one neuron ever needs to connect to another, the synapse must already exist. Your brain can change its weight, but it can't quickly add a new one. This leads to vast numbers of synapses with weights near zero, which are just waiting to have their weights increased so they can become meaningful. Let's consider an example. Your brain needs to remember some object which has some physical attributes. Like most artificial neural networks, all the initial synapses are allocated with weights near zero. When your brain figures out which connections are important, it can quickly increase the weights of the relevant synapses. For simplicity, imagine you can only see these five colors. Once the brain has decoded that you're looking at a green object, for example, it can strengthen the synapse to the neuron representing green. It needed to have the synapses to all the colors so it could strengthen just the one which was important. The computerized neuron engine does not share this limitation. When it figures out which synapses are needed, they can be added in just a few microseconds, only slightly slower than changing the weight. This means that the computer doesn't need to carry around all the zillions of near-zero synapses, it just needs to store the ones with significant weights because it can allocate new synapses as needed. 
So how many synapses per neuron are actually significant? My designs of neural circuits, which do useful things, shows huge numbers of neurons with just a few synapses. But there are also a small percentage of neurons which do need a very large number of synapses. And so for this round, we'll use 20 as the number of significant synapses per neuron. This round means that with just 20 of today's CPUs networked together, I could do the useful processing of the human brain in real time. Now, you might wonder why I've used a 1 teraflop CPU as the benchmark when I could have used a GPU with over 100 teraflops. For the first three rounds, that could have been reasonable, but from here on out, features cannot be implemented efficiently on a GPU. Because of their architecture, GPUs are not efficient on the sparse arrays described here. For the future, it is easy to conceive a GPU-like processor designed around the processing of the neuron engine, but it will take a few years to get a similar hundredfold performance increase. The next round brings up another inconvenient characteristic of synapses, but its performance impact is difficult to assess, so I'll call it round 4A. Although your brain can easily set the weights of synapses, there is no practical way to read back that weight information. So if you were to observe that red light plus green light makes yellow, when you see a yellow object, you might be tempted to think that the brain strengthens synapses to both red and green. Your brain cannot work this way because this creates no practical way for your brain to recall other yellow objects, which we know it can do. The issue becomes even more obvious if the weights are fractional. Consider pink. To represent pink, you need these fractional synapse weights. But you can see that although you might store the pink this way, there is no way to link related pink objects. But a computer can do this because it can easily read back the synapse weights. As I said, there is no impact on the computational efficiency of the brain but this has a huge impact on the amount of information which the brain might conceivably contain. If you can't store values in synapses because you can't read them back, the useful information content of the brain drops from a quadrillion items to perhaps a few billion items, and much lower if you actually design the appropriate neural circuits. This doesn't mean that fractional synapse weights are useless. It means that synapse weights could represent the confidence or the strength of a memory, but not the memory itself. For round five, I'd like to mention redundancy. We know that in your brain, the failure of individual neurons or synapses makes essentially no difference. This is in contrast with the CPU, which can be disabled with the loss of individual transistors. Likewise, many of the networks I've designed for the neuron engine would also fail with the failure of any individual neuron or synapse. To make them more robust, as we know the brain is, would require at least twice as many neurons or synapses. But the computer doesn't need that redundancy because today's computers are so inherently reliable. With two to one redundancy, the computer can emulate the complete brain function with only eight billion neurons instead of 16. So for this round, we need only 10 CPUs. 
for round number six, finally, I'd like to wrap up with the impact of sequential data. Consider remembering a sequence of digits like a phone number. One might initially assume that the 10 digits of the phone number are represented by 10 synapses going out from a hypothetical phone number neuron to the various digit neurons. When the phone number neuron fires, you would like to get the digits of the number. 202-456-1414 But in the brain, it can't work that way. The firing signal from a neuron arrives at all synapses at about the same time, so there is no way to store the order of the digits. Handling repeated digits further complicates things. This means any step in any ordered data must be represented by at least one neuron, not just one synapse, and at least two neurons if the speed of recall is to be controlled as shown here. 202 The computer wins again because it can simply set a flag which indicates whether the various synapses of a neuron are to be processed in parallel like a biological neuron or sequentially as we'd like for this example. This means that it can store the digits of the phone number as just 10 synapses. What is the impact? For sequential information, each sequential step neuron in your brain, encumbered as it is with 10,000 synapses, can be replaced in the neuron engine with a single synapse. We can only estimate the portion of information in your brain which is sequential, but I must point out that it's not just phone numbers. When you remember words or phrases or songs, that's sequential. When you remember an image with objects in front or behind one another, that's sequential too. When you remember that something is above or below or to the right or the left, that's sequential. When you remember how to walk to your bedroom or drive to the grocery store, that's all sequential information too. If we were to estimate that half of your neocortex is used up storing sequential data, not only are we reducing the number of synapses per neuron, but our computer can reduce the number of useful neurons by another 50%. With this last round, the brain is now only the equivalent of five of today's CPUs. What does this all add up to? Any way you slice it, the potential for computers to emulate the capabilities of the human brain is either here already or will be in the very near future. We don't need acres of servers and millions of dollars. With computer power no longer a roadblock, AGI is just awaiting some neuroscience or software breakthrough which could come at any time. AGI is not some far-off nebulous future, it's just around the corner. Right now is the time to start thinking and talking seriously about AGI, its risks, and its ramifications. If you've learned something from this video, be sure to share it with your colleagues. And I would also appreciate comments, subscribes, and likes which help me to create additional videos for this future AI YouTube channel. And once again, thanks for watching.